Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, and I know I'm E.G. Marshall. The reason I stress this is because the world seems to be suffering from an identity crisis. People are turning to the Orient in a search for their real selves. Others turn to drugs, and others to new forms of consciousness raising. Today's story is titled, A Question of Identity. But in this tale, the search is not for oneself, but to identify the right husband. What do you want of me, Hillary? Proof. Prove to me that you are the real Bob Christie, the man I divorced 12 years ago. Prove it with memories, the, the little things that only you and I would know. Things I've tried to forget. Hillary, this is no place for reminiscing. It... Why is that phony tourist still hanging around? You can't use him as an excuse anymore. He's leaving. Yes, and he's also leaving that expensive camera case behind. Come on, Hillary, run! drama, A Question of Identity, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Joan Lovejoy. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Certainty Fiberglass Attic Insulation. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The standard engine is a V8. Standard tires, steel belted radio. There are front and rear stabilizer bars, special springs and shock valving, fast ratio power steering and a rally steering wheel. What makes all this interesting is that it belongs to a full-size six-passenger Buick. The 1977 Lefebvre Sport Coupe. You'll have to drive it to believe it. If your attic has less than six inches of insulation on the floor, you're being robbed every day without ever knowing it. To stop the under-insulation robber and possibly save up to 30% on the cost of fuel to heat and cool your home, inspect your attic. Then see your neighborhood CertainTeed building materials dealer or insulation contractor. CertainTeed fiberglass attic insulation will stop that robber once and for all. and skyjacking. Unfortunately, these crimes have become so common that we almost accept them as part of the perils of today's living. Of course, we all know that the motive for kidnapping or skyjacking is either political or involving money for ransom, and sometimes both. Today's story starts with a kidnapping which had neither of these motives. Indeed, it was so unusual that it seemed to be motiveless. My name is Hilary Cummings and I'm divorced. I mention this only because it plays such an important part in the incredibly strange things that happened to me. It all started on an ordinary Wednesday as I left my apartment in New York City on my way to my job as court stenographer. It was raining. No chance for a cab, I knew, so... I opened my umbrella and started for the bus stop on the corner. Two men ranged up, one on each side of me. Miss Hillary coming? Uh, yes. You'd like to you come with us? What? Uh, who are you? Oh, I'll be explaining when we get where we're going. Our car's right over there. Well, thank you, but my bus is right over here. You can ride with me and explain. That's not satisfactory, Miss Cummings. Let go of my arm or I'll scream. Right, oh, I'll... Uh, help me lift her into the car. All right, give her a chance to breathe, Harry. Miss Collins, you can scream if you wish. It won't do you any good. I was 
being kidnapped. My first emotion? Utter disbelief. And then followed quickly by anger and fear. Particularly when the man who had been doing all the talking attempted to reassure me. I give you my word that no harm will come to you. We're simply going to ask a favor of you. Well, for people asking favors, you go about it in a calculated way to get a refusal. I've already apologized for this, uh... Kidnapping. Oh, you got it all wrong. You'll understand everything when we reach our destination. Well, the police won't. They know we're kidnapping when they hear about it. No more talking. Now, shut up. Unless you want to be gagged. There was no question that he meant what he said. So I obeyed. The car traveled fast up the West Side Highway, crossed the Henry Hudson Bridge into Riverdale, turned off at Fearston, and came to a stop in the driveway of a gracious old mansion. My um, captors politely ushered me in through large double doors and then into a paneled library. A gray-haired man with twinkling blue eyes and the face of a cherub rose from behind a large desk. Oh, Miss Cumming, I'm delighted to see you. Please, sit down. Uh, would you care for some coffee? Hmm? Tea? Uh, or rather, uh, excellent croissant, eh? I'll tell you exactly what I'd like. To get out of here and down to my job. What do you think is going to happen when I don't show up or, or call in? Nothing. I assure you everything has been uh, taken care of. And I'm supposed to take your word for that? Oh, not at all. If you wish, you may call and speak to your superior, Mr. Uh, Mr. Springsteen, I believe. Who are you and what do you want? Who I am is of no importance. What I want is, uh, well, simple. I want a small favor from you, one which will do your country a great service. Are you telling me that you're with the government? That's right. Then why didn't you just call and ask me to come and see you? Well, there were considerations, time for one, security for another. Security? Look, are, are you sure you have the right woman? Hmm. Hillary Cummings is your maiden name. And some time ago, you were Mrs. Robert Christie, correct? Oh, my marriage to Bob has something to do with my being here, then. Hmm. It has everything to do with it. I have no choice, believe me. <sighs> Miss Cummings... You would uh, you would know your husband if you were to see him again, now, wouldn't you? Well, I... I'm, I'm not sure. You know he had some plastic surgery done after the... after the accident. I haven't seen or, or spoken with him since. We're aware of that. I can only tell you that the plastic surgery did not alter his looks that much. What is much more important, I think, are the things that remain constant, such as memories that were shared by... Only the two of you. I, I'm getting a very bad feeling. I don't know whether I'm Alice in Wonderland or a, a character in a James Bond story. I would like to leave now. May I? No. I'm a prisoner. Well, only until you hear me out. Just please listen, and if you then decide you don't want to help us, well, you'll be perfectly free to leave. Do we have a deal? Do I have a choice? I'm the head of an intelligence operation, one you've never heard of, an intelligence gathering outfit. And how does Bob connect up with this? Well, he's done some work for us at various times. No one can question his extensive traveling because of his regular job as a hotel management consultant. He makes an ideal courier, you know, someone who carries messages, you know. I've read enough spy stories to know what a courier does. <laughs> so we, we come to our problem. Some weeks ago, we were told about an important message that was shortly coming out of Vienna. Our sources informed us that the message had extraordinary importance. We therefore decided to use your ex-husband to pick up the message and bring it back. Bob was legitimately visiting Vienna at that time, and we prearranged with Bob to send us a postcard setting up a time and place where he would deliver this message to us. I've mentioned its importance before, so you... You may understand our consternation when in the past three days we received three different postcards, all presumably signed by your ex-husband, setting up three different times and places for us to accept delivery. As much as it embarrasses me to admit it, well, there must have been a security breach of significant proportions. But what has all this to do with me? Well, in order to make absolutely sure we get the right message, we need you to identify... The right Bob Christie. 
Mr. Uh, 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 Smith. Smith will do. Mr. Smith. Now, I hope you won't be upset if I say that what you've just told me is the most absurd story I have ever heard. Well, why absurd? You have employed a man as a courier for some years, and yet you expect me to believe that you can't identify him? Bob Christie and I have never met. Actually, he's only had contact with two different operatives, none of whom spend more than five minutes with him. But you must have pictures or, or fingerprints. Of course, you, you must have his prints. We have both in his file and in our computer banks. But unfortunately, his file is missing and something has happened to foul up the computer tape. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you. It means that I, I'd have to see Bob again. Well, that would be painful. Yes. I know, I know. I've read the court record of the divorce proceedings. Court records? <laughs> they don't begin to tell you anything. There's no record of the last words I spoke to Bob Christie, is there? No. Well, I've never told this to anyone. And I'm only telling it to you so that you'll understand why I must walk out of here. Right after the accident, I... I went to the hospital. Bob was lying there in his bed. If he saw me come in or heard me, he, he didn't say anything. And I went to the bed, leaned over and whispered, Damn you forever, Bob Christie. I hope to God you die. And now you are asking me to meet with this man and identify him for you. I have to. Are, are you sure that Bob heard those words you said to him in the hospital? Well, I, I suppose he did. I, I never thought about it. I just know I said that. Perhaps he was unconscious. I'm not saying he was, but... Well, he might have been. Then he would never have heard them. Suppose I... Suppose I identify the wrong man. No, it's hardly likely. You're not going to be meeting a stranger. One man will undoubtedly have the memories that only you two can share. You'll see. You talk as, as though I were, I were going to do it. We checked on your background. You have a strong conscience. You can't walk away from this and live with yourself. Particularly when I tell you that the moment you appear on the scene... You become a pawn, and perhaps expendable. And what has that to do with conscience? Well, your record also shows you have courage. Well, I'd like a little more time. Come in. A man with a passport bearing the name of Robert Christie. He's on TWA's Flight 13 with a stop in Switzerland. He's due to arrive at Kennedy at 3 p.m. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid you've run out of time, Miss Cummings. Your first appointment is 4 o'clock this afternoon in the Blue Sky Lounge of the Metropolitan Motel. All motels near airports have the same air of impermanence. I looked for the third table on the left and anxiously tried to recall every word of the Hurried briefing I've been given. Now, it's really a simple procedure, Miss Cummings. You'll go to the Sky Blue Lounge and be sure to take the third table on the left. I suppose someone's sitting there. There better not be. It's been reserved in your name. Now, you'll give the captain your name and order a slow gin fizz. I loathe them. Well, you don't have to drink it. Just order it. Now, here's your copy of Great Hostelries of the World. Be sure you have it open so the title shows. And then? Wait for the contact. And for your sake and ours, let's hope that he's the real Bob Christie. Your part will be finished after you drop the message off, as you've been instructed. But what if he... Now, you, you have the phone number for all other contingencies, right? There'll be somebody at that phone 24 hours a day. Good luck. So, there I was, sitting at the third table on the left with my book open as directed, and nothing happened. I looked at my watch, 4.15. Still nothing. I decided to wait a little longer. I I'd given him an hour. So I continued to read. The gin fizz untouched. And then the waiter handed me a sealed envelope. This was not according to plan. However, I opened it. It read, If this is your idea of a joke, it's sick. This is no laughing matter, so get out. It was unsigned, 
And I looked around the room, but saw no one remotely resembling Bob. I glanced up at the waiter. He was obviously expecting an answer. I simply shook my head and tore the note to shreds. It wasn't more than ten minutes later. I never heard him. I, I was reading, and the only way I knew he was there was when his hand closed the book, and he said... You're just as stubborn and spiteful as always. If you have an explanation, I'll listen. Everyone knows that love is blind, but how about hate? In the case of Hillary Cummings, she's been asked to identify her own husband, a man she hates. Will this hatred lead her to make a mistake? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. When you say bye. St. Louis, Missouri. I'd recognize him anywhere. How often have we said those words without thinking? And what is there to think about? Certainly it's a simple matter to recognize someone you've known intimately, even if you haven't seen or spoken with him in a dozen years. Unless... There are three remarkable lookalikes, each one of them claiming to be your ex-husband. That was Hillary Cummings' problem. She is face to face with the first claimant and desperately unsure. I'm still waiting, Hillary. Well, the plastic surgeons did a good job. You look just, just as you should. I want to know why you're sitting at this particular table, in this particular lounge, at this particular time. Because Robert Christie is supposed to deliver something to me. <laughs> Agency sure must be scraping the bottom of the barrel if they have to use you as a pickup contact. Here. Here's the message. I can't say it's been nice seeing you. Wait just a minute. There's more. No, not for me there isn't. Well, suit yourself. It will make it easier for me when I talk to the other two men who claim to be Robert Christie. What? The agency received three postcards setting up three different meetings. That's why, as you so charmingly put it, they scraped the bottom of the barrel and came up with me. You always were a liar. I don't know how you found out as much as you did, but I do know the agency has my print. Your file is missing, and somebody was also able to mess up the computer tape. Oh, somebody's given you all the answers. You can check. I'm going to. Right now. He left to phone the agency, I suppose. He could have been Bob. He'd had plastic surgery, and maybe this is the way Bob would have looked after aging 12 years. And he talked just as viciously as Bob had. But somehow that bothered me. I wondered if he'd been coached. Shouldn't the years have taken some of the edge off his bitterness? Straighten me out on just what you want from me. You know damn well that I'm Bob. How about the other two men? They're imposters. Well, I'll admit, you look about the way Bob might have, considering the plastic surgery. You seem to have many of Bob's characteristics. But I don't want to pass judgment until I'm absolutely sure. Oh, what a clever little trap. I don't have my birth certificate with me, but... Do you like a peek at my passport? That scar above your lip. That's new, isn't it? it? It doesn't look as though it came from plastic surgery. 
And Bob didn't have any scar there. It was very observant. I got this from a dog. Oh, uh, but Bob... Hated dogs. You're right again. But you see, there was this girl. She's a good friend of mine. She had a poodle. One day, the little mutt picks a Doberman pincher to fight with. In trying to separate them, I was the only one bitten. I see. What do you see? If you had any eyes or brains, you'd know that I'm Bob. We were married in the Church of the Good Shepherd on January 31st, 1961. Fred Stone was my best man. Your old college roommate, Gloria Humphreys, was your maid of honor. It was a blizzard. But we didn't care. We were going to the Bahamas for our honeymoon. Enough? Very convincing. But if you were an imposter, you might have been coached. Okay. Do you want absolute proof? I'll give it to you. The hotel has rooms upstairs. I'll register. We'll go up together and I'll prove it That's to you. That's enough. I suppose you, you'd suggest that I make that test with all three of you. You wouldn't have to. I promise I'll convince you. No. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to report your refusal to the agency. Somehow I don't think they'll like it. Hello? Yes, Miss Cummings? Oh, oh, it is you. I was afraid I'd forgotten the number. I told you this won't be man 24 hours. Well, how did it go? Uh, miserably. You didn't get the message? Oh, yes. Yes, he gave me the message. And you delivered it? Just the way you told me. I, I mailed it immediately. Good. I take it he wasn't our Bob Christie. Well, I'm not sure. He did know an awful lot about the past. Well, now... What do I do about the next appointment? I was hoping it wouldn't be necessary. You'll find all the information you need in an envelope, which is on its way to your apartment. I was completely miscast as a female James Bond. Instead of feeling excited or curious about my meeting with the second man who claimed to be my ex-husband, I dreaded it. I hated the frightening spy jargon of the instructions. You will proceed to the Central Park Zoo. You will arrive at the fifth bench from the south entrance to the zoo, not before 1.30 nor after 1.35. It has been arranged there will be no one sitting on that particular bench. You will seat yourself and prominently display the book review section of last Sunday's paper. A copy has been furnished you. A man will sit next to you who will say the following words exactly. I never can understand people who judge books by reviews, to which you will answer exactly, I much prefer judging them that way than by their covers. I pretended to read the book review section while trying to spot someone who looked like it might be Bob. Finally, a man approached, and I blinked. For a moment, I thought he was the same man I'd seen at the airport, and then I noticed he was a trifle stouter, and his hair was a little thinner. Hillary? It, it, it is you, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Oh, of course. But but I don't understand... Oh, excuse me. I, um... Uh, I never can understand people who judge books by reviews. I much prefer judging them that way than by their covers. Hillary, there's... There must be something very wrong. Well, wasn't that the proper identification? I, I don't mean that. They, they must have had some reason to involve you, but they shouldn't have. Hillary, how, how did you get into this? I'll tell you if you explain to me how you got that scar on your lip. Hillary, this is no game. You're right in the middle of something dark and dangerous. <laughs> oh, that's a switch. You trying to make me believe you're concerned about me. Still a smart argument. Okay, it's your neck. The scar? I got it from a dog bite. A dog? Not mine. I broke up a fight between two dogs. Now, look, I'd like to turn over the message and say goodbye. I wish it could be that easy. But three different men claim to be Bob Christie. 
The agency asked me to discover which one is really Bob. Oh, I can't believe that. The agency, the agency no... has goofed. They've lost the file containing Bob Christie's records and fingerprints. You saying I have no cover any longer? Someone knows all about me and what I'm carrying? Well, that's even worse than anything I could have imagined. Why? If you're really Bob, you have nothing to worry about. Have you any idea what will happen to the two men you brand as imposters? They'll go to jail. Sure. If they're lucky, more likely they'll turn up in a morgue. No, oh, you're exaggerating. Did you ever stop to check on whether or not you were followed when you came here? Well, I... Sure, of course not. It never occurred to you. Just look around. Look and see if you recognize anyone who's been here since you came. Oh, that's ridiculous. I have my head examined for staying this long. Goodbye, Hillary, and good luck. You are the one who's going to need the luck if you go before you prove to me that you really are Bob. Just found a new version of hell. I'm chained to the woman I divorced 12 years ago, chained more securely by fear than I ever was by marriage. All right, Hillary, what do you want of me? Proof? Prove to me that... Am I the first of the three men you met? No, you're the second. Oh, that's good. Well, that's good about it. Proves you weren't sure about the first guy. Tell him on the wild sports shirt over there. Oh, yeah. Look, leaning against the tree with a camera. You see him? Oh, yes, he's obviously a tourist. So obvious that he bothers me. He's just been standing there fooling with his camera ever since I sat down. Oh, relax. Now, look, if you are Bob, you would remember moments we shared that only the real Bob Christie would know. Things that I've tried to put out of my mind the past dozen years. Oh, that's a cop-out. Why isn't that phony tourist going on about his business? Why is he still hanging all around? All right, all right. If you can't give me anything... All right, all right. All right. How's this for openers? Uh, well, Philadelphia. The playhouse in the park. Remember the, the, the play, Star Spangled Girl? We left early and got lost. We couldn't find our way out of Fairmount Park. No one asked directions. We laughed or we had to stop the car and seriously debated going to sleep right there in the park. Mm, that's not bad. Not completely, either. Oh, now you can relax. That phony tourist, as you call him, is leaving. Oh, wait a minute, I'm leaving that expensive camera case behind. Come on, Hillary. What? Don't ask stupid questions. Move! Well, now, now maybe you believe me. You know that bomb was meant for me? There are other countries involved, foreign agencies, and they want the real Bob Christie dead. Well, if that's the truth, isn't it possible that these other governments want the woman who who can identify him dead also? You're not very good at your job. Just tell me something that will prove to me beyond any doubt that you're Bob. Oh, Hillary, you're too much. Someone just tried to kill me, and you're still asking for, for romantic reminiscence. Not necessarily romantic, just something... Something so personal that only you and I would know about it. Okay. Look, would anyone but I know about the crazy notion you had that death somehow arise when you run out of memories? I... I think you'll have to fill me in more. Come on, you know we both love to walk, ramble around the city exploring, and frequently we'd come to a street that held memories for you. The, the the old-fashioned ice cream store where you had sodas when you were a kid. Or or maybe the, the house where your old high school chum lived. And you'd always say, I wonder, I wonder, maybe if you live in one city your whole life and store up all those memories, and then suddenly there's nothing left, no more memories, I think that's when a person finally dies. Now, would anyone but me have known about that? Well, it, it, it's certainly what I asked for. But I still can't. I can only say, you've given me something to think about. There is nothing more untrustworthy than an autobiography. Make a little test. Find an old friend and reminisce. Recall some incident that happened to both of you more than ten years ago. 
I'll wager you'll have two very different versions, and each will honestly believe that his is true. That, more than anything, is Hillary's problem. I'll be back shortly. No home ever seems to have enough extension cords. You always have one less than you need. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest you check out True Value Hardware Store's complete selection of durable True Test extension cords for indoor and outdoor use. For indoors, you'll find a True Test six-foot double extension cord with two outlets and a 15-foot remote control cord with a convenient on and off switch that lets you turn lights, TV, or appliances on and off from 15 feet away. True Value Hardware Stores also offer a selection of True Test extension cords for outdoor use. These heavy-duty cords are designed to withstand moisture and extreme temperatures, and they come in a wide range of sizes. End the extension cord shortage at your house with True Test indoor and outdoor extension cords. You'll always find the one more you need at your participating True Value Hardware Store. Remember, True Value, more than just a name, it's their way of doing business. And tell them Pat Summerall sent you. Shakespeare said it's a wise father that knows his own child. Shakespeare never wrote anything about a woman knowing her own husband. Of course, he had also never heard of plastic surgery, which made Hillary Cummings' problem of picking the right husband from among three claimants more than ordinarily difficult. It was also becoming dangerous. Do you know about the bomb that exploded in the park? We were informed. Well, what about the bomb? The second bomb, Christie. Is he genuine? I'm not sure. That's why I'm asking about the bomb. The bomb indicates two things. One, the Jupo is a threat. And two, that the information is as important as we were led to believe. Couldn't it prove that the man I, I was with was the real Bob? And someone wanted him dead? Or you, Miss Cummings. I'm concerned. You should be, too. The faster you can tell me this man is my husband or this man isn't, the better off we'll be. Now, about the uh, second man, why won't you eliminate him? Well, he, he knew something about a silly superstition of mine. I, a, a way I had of thinking about memories and places. Was it something unusual and uh, personal? Oh, yes. Wasn't that fairly conclusive? Well, I'm hesitating for two reasons. One is that any organization that could steal Bob's file and get into your computer setup certainly would have the resources to check into my life and come up with a number of incidents and, and then instruct the impersonator when to use them. Yes, that's a possibility. And secondly, this man used the phrase, how's this for openers? Now, not only was that a jarring speech pattern for Bob, but he hated cards and card playing. Openers is a word Bob would never have used. Well, there's that, of course. So that's why I must keep the next appointment with the third man. The Red Rooster was one of the smarter east side restaurants. My instruction said the man would carry the identification. He would be seated with an ice bucket for champagne, but there would be no bottle. He would also have a cigarette holder in his mouth, but no cigarette. The table was to be reserved in the name of John Christopher. The maitre d' led me toward a man sitting at a rear table. He looked up and smiled. He didn't seem as surprised as the others had. And we sat for a short while in silence. I, I began to feel nervous, so I asked a rather silly question. Uh, aren't we supposed to have something to say to each other? <laughs> You mean that uh, nonsense about the proper identification with passwords? Okay, here it goes. I hope I remember it. Uh, you see. Uh... Now, don't you feel that there's something sad about empty ice buckets and empty cigarette holders? Only if they're empty unintentionally. Oh, really? Who do you think makes up these silly bits, hmm? Ah, well. Now that the uh, formalities have been taken care of, let's order a marvelously expensive dinner. After all, it's on the agency. Where did you get that scar on your lip? It's not from surgery, I know. Are you feeling all right, Hillary? Maybe meeting me after all these years... Meeting you hasn't bothered me at all. You are the third man claiming to be Bob Christie. And quite frankly, in my opinion, 
the least likely. Because you are getting the worst impersonation. Maybe that's because I'm not trying. Mm, very clever, but still, I'm convincing. <laughs> Why? Because if the other two were putting on an act, they obviously were better coached than you. I was more shaken than I cared to admit. This man did look more like what I had expected Bob to look like after 12 years. And then he shook me even more when he ordered not only Bob's favorite dishes, but mine also. Well, how's the food? <sighs> Delicious. Now, how did you get that scar? Well, this, I got the scar trying to be a peacemaker between two oh, fighting dogs. Damn. And three men, three scars, three tails of a dog fight. Hmm? <laughs> you seem to take this very lightly. Well, now, I know who I am, and I know who you are, and I know what I'm carrying. I'll give it to you, and you make your own decision. I'd like more specifics on our past before I make up my mind. I'm sorry I refuse to oblige. Refuse? Or can't? Oh, poor Hillary. You're attracted to me, and you resent it. You resent it because of the quarrels and bitterness that made us break up. But why should I dredge up the past to prove to you that I'm Bob? You could set your mind at rest and make me very happy by using the final irrevocable test. Of... No, absolutely not. Yes, I expect it to be turned down. But really, not quite so emphatically. The reason I am so emphatic is the real Bob simply wasn't as charming as you. You have a short memory, love. Not as short as yours. You've forgotten that night when the neighbors called the police. And you've and... forgotten the three great years. The two years at Lake Dumore and all the other times before. Before what? Go on. Before David died. Before everything went rotten. Before you blamed me for David's death. I beg you not to take David in that horrible, jazzed up fourth car. But you did. And you always forget that it was the other car that jumped the divider and hit us head and on. And if you hadn't been going more than 80 miles an hour, it wouldn't... He would never... Oh, no, no, stop, stop. Please, please, stop it. Don't... No, no, listen to me, listen to me, please. I'm... I'm not Bob Christie. I never was your husband. My name is Charles Shelburne, and I... I can't stand to see you cry. What? What are you saying? Look, uh, I'll prove it. And wet the napkin and rub off all the fake scars. Look, you see? I'm not Bob Christie. I'm sick of this stupid masquerade. I wish I'd never started with it. Then, then why did you? Because I'm an idiot. Did, did you say your name was Charles Shelburne? The Charles Shelburne who wrote Eagle Victorious? Six years and not another line since. <laughs> At least not another line I liked. But what has that to do with with your being here and, and trying to fool me? Oh, that's very simple. If you're a writer who's had a smash hit novel right off the bat, and then you find out that somehow nothing seems to come, nothing, nothing flows. So you run away, as I did, to a little town in France, and you teach English. And all the time you're... you're at yourself. And, and then suddenly an old college jump turns up. You haven't seen him in 20 years, and he tells you he's with the government, all very hush-hush, and you'll be doing the country a big service, and maybe you could even get an idea for a book. All because I happen to look like I might be a guy called Bob Christie. If I hadn't read Eagle Victorious, I don't think I'd, I'd believe what you're telling me. You're a romanticist. I think sucker is a better word. What I thought was going to be sort of a lark turned out to be something else. Now that I've met you. Oh, no, this is ridiculous. What's going to happen to you when your old chum finds out that you've told me the truth? Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Here, I'll give you the message, but you can tell whomever you report to that it's a phony. But aren't you afraid that something... I suppose the stakes are high, but I can't see how hurting me will help them. Well, what are you going to do? Go back to my hotel, the Berkeley Plaza. Stay there for the next two days. 
And then go back to France and teach. What about your writing? If you are really interested, you know where to find me. I don't remember exactly how I got back to my apartment. My head was in a whirl. The real Bob now had to be one of the first two men I'd met. But which? And what would happen to the last Bob, Charles Shelburne, if I could believe his story? And I did so desperately want to believe. I didn't even look up after I closed the door to my apartment. Welcome home, <laughs> Hillary. How did you get into my apartment? I'm here because I want to know exactly what you're going to tell the agency. None of your business. Entirely my business. I was able to get in here with a key I had made because I got nervous. I saw you running around interviewing prospective ex-husbands. Put that phone down. Ow. Ow. All right. You're stronger than I am. But you've just given yourself away. Now I know you're not the real Bob. Do you? Damn you forever, Bob Christie. I hope to God you die. You really, really are Bob. You remember what I whispered to you in the hospital? Why didn't you tell me this right away at the airport bar? Oh, come on, Hillary. When you told me there were two other guys pretending to be me, and I knew the agency wouldn't involve you unless they were willing to take your word. Then remembering how you felt about me, I figured there was a good chance you'd make a mistake on purpose. And hope the agency would kill you for me, Go to the head of the class. I could still do that, though, couldn't I? That's why I'm here. To give you a reason to tell the truth. <laughs> That's almost funny. To need a reason to tell the truth. How would you like $50,000? You mean you're that frightened? You're offering me $50,000 because you think... I'm not offering you any. This money will come from my employers. From the agency? Oh, Forget they the will... agency. This is my own deal. I've been planning this for years. The agency ran me all over the world like an errand boy and paid me peanuts. Now, I made my contacts. I knew someday something really big would come along. And it did. This message... My employers are anxious to make sure the agency gets it and believes it. I warned them that this whole elaborate charade with three different Bob Christie's was too much. They felt it would guarantee the agency believing it. Are you telling me that you're a traitor? I'm me. I drive cars too fast, spend too much live too hard, and never am really happy. Well, now I'm taking the ultimate gamble. I'm offering you $50,000 for just telling the truth. Yes? This is Hillary Cummings, Mr. Smith. This is the last time I'll be talking to you. I'm leaving the country. Have you solved our problem? No. I can't make up my mind. I warn you, Miss Cummings. You've embarked on a foolish course. Which one are you trying to protect? Myself. Who's threatening you? From, from whom do you need protection? From myself. And thoughts of revenge. Miss Cummings, you're deliberately talking in riddles. I and riddles are exclusively your area, Mr. Smith. All right. I'll make it very simple. You can stop worrying about which is the right message. Because all the messages are false and designed to mislead you. Oh. Well, then that means that Bob Christie is a... Bob Christie is no longer my problem, Mr. Smith. Whatever he is, he's all yours.
One of the in things today for people seeking identity is to spend two weekends or 60 hours at a transcendental meditation session. Hillary Cummings did it faster and perhaps easier, but not everyone is given the opportunity to play Mata Hari. I'll be back shortly. The 1977 Buick Regal. It comes with Buick's terrific V6 engine. It carries six people and lots of Buick comfort. It's mean. It's maneuverable in city traffic. It's the most luxurious mid-sized car Buick builds. Yeah, this new Regal is pretty much everything a car should be. Except for one thing. It isn't yours yet. But it can be. Just see your Buick dealer for a test drive. Soon. <laughs> I have bronchial asthma, but I also have a class to teach, so I take Bronchade tablets. They help keep my occasional asthma attacks away for hours. Primatine tablets, they work, but Bronchade has an extra ingredient to help get rid of congestion. And with asthma, getting rid of bronchial congestion is really important. Bronchade helps me breathe easy for hours. Bronchade tablets do more to let you breathe easier. Use only as directed. stories go back as far as 2400 B.C., when a party of spies under the command of Joshua were dispatched by Moses to bring back reports of conditions in the land of Canaan. They did, and the reports were in conflict. Ever since then, the intelligent services of the world have recognized the importance of the gathering of information and the distribution of misinformation. You can trust me not to misinform you. Our cast included Joan Lovejoy, Robert Dryden, Joe Silver, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Look out the window. Okay. Any window? Any window. What do you see? Have I missed something? It isn't raining. That's right. There's no rain. The thunder stopped. But just a few seconds ago. Downstairs, I heard it. I know I heard it. Look out there. The grass isn't wet. The flowers are all standing up straight. The paths are dry. Well, now, look, that's not possible. I mean, there couldn't have been a terrific storm in one part of the house and, and sunlight and roses and all those beautiful things in another part. That's just not possible. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.